Welcome to Beauty Cocktails and Girl Talk. So to kick it off, Jamie. Thank you. you. You're welcome. Tell us one beauty product that you cannot live without. One beauty product that I cannot live without. Um, I hate when my face feels dry. So be like face oil in general, the fact that the oils have become more popular and not just like a cream or a lotion. I love, I use a face oil right now. That's a, a prune based face oil that I totally got hooked on by Chrissy Teigen when she like randomly posted about <laughs> them. And the best thing is they're a tiny like mom and pop family operation in California. And she totally blew them up. So I'm wow. very happy for them, but the product itself is just a simple prune oil. And I just put it on my skin every night before bed and it just hydrates. What's it called? Didn't do. Um, I can go grab it. Oh, <laughs> I no, can't no, remember no, the okay. name. Your skin looks amazing though. So I'm like, yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, skin, skin really does look amazing. So thank I've you. Heard. I also worked out today. So that helps. <laughs> yeah. Get that that blood <laughs> flowing. For sure. <laughs> Prune though, that's, that's a, I don't really hear too many like prune based oils. I haven't either. They have like a small plum farm in, in California and now they are a very popular company. <laughs> we may have to have you get that at one point <laughs> or just. <shut laughs> Bless me. Yeah. You. Ryan, go ahead with the, you know what the next question is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so if you could have cocktails with anyone living or dead, anyone at all throughout all of time, who would it be? And what would you drink? This feels very important. <laughs> throughout history. I mean, I kind of think it'd be fun to drink with Einstein because he's so smart, but not uptight. So I feel like it wouldn't be like an intimidating conversation, but it would be really interesting. Okay. Well, if you had to pick a topic of conversation to have with Einstein, what, what would your topic be? Maybe something completely unrelated to science, like what his favorite pizza topics are, or, <laughs> you know, like his favorite flavor of ice cream, like the things that make us human and that we can connect with, like with intellectuals, like you can like come down that. to like a basic level in order to kind of connect on a, on a human level see his genius come out in like such a natural interesting way i like that i like that <laughs> that's awesome yeah einstein's pretty cool um so okay if you post covid i don't know if you're a girls night in type of person or girls night out but what would be your ideal night in or out with your best girlfriends I love to eat and I would rather have a four hour dinner than like go to a bar or a club like I, I would rather have a nice long coursed out dinner I love like task specific drinks things you drink before dinner or after dinner I like things that have like a specific role so the idea of like an aperitif or a digestif I just kind of love even though I'm very casual I love that formal style of dining yeah um and I also love things where it's an active and kind of communal pursuit when it comes to food. So I love Korean barbecue, oh. things like that, where you can sit around a table with friends and you just drink and you cook as you're hungry. You don't have to eat when someone's putting your food in front of you. It's way more of a conversational and kind of a casual meal to have, I think. Nice. Oh, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so fun. Korean barbecue. That's like probably my very favorite like place to eat. It's it's absolutely incredible. And, and they haven't been able to do it during quarantine and during the pandemic because a lot of the places have outdoor dining, but they don't put the grills out there, which is like the whole point of it. Yeah, I did go to one place in Westchester, New York uh, a few months ago, luckily, which was awesome. But yeah, that's so cool. That's literally like my favorite thing. Um, so I also got to see some uh, episodes recently since you joined the show, SVU, which is super cool. Um, so we love you as Kat on there. Um, so let's go back to when you first started. Like, you know, uh, were you were you offered the role? Was it an audition that you were interested in from the beginning? You know, how, how did that all like start? It's kind of an interesting story because I hadn't worked for 18 months. So I was like over it. I was working with a cannabis company, trying to help them develop something there and do some business development with them. I had really sort of taken my brain 50% out of the business because I had had such a rough year and a half and just wasn't booking. So this audition came along and to be honest, I was like, okay, I'll do it, you know, and submitted a tape. 
And, you know, I even felt like my audition itself, like I wasn't sure if it was okay, if it was enough. I had just lost complete confidence in myself. So I had second guessed it. And my coach who always tapes me, you know, he said, I think it's great. I think it's perfect for law and order, just understated and just kind of business focused. And I ended up getting the job and out of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of self tapes, like every actor knows self tapes are like the bane of your existence. Cause you don't get that interaction. And I've submitted hundreds of them in my career and never booked ever in my life off of a self tape. And this is the first and only time I've ever booked a job because I sent the tape from LA into New York, forgot about it because I had really unhinged from the attachment that I would have in the past to these types of auditions. Two weeks later, I got a phone call out of the blue saying, Hey, you're still in the running for this thing. And I was like, Oh, okay, cool. You know? And then a week later I got a phone call saying that they wanted me. And initially I was given, you know, a slate of like four or so episodes. Well, they really like to test people out on a show like SVU that has so much history to see the chemistry, to see if you can work well on screen and off screen, and you can get along with the rest of the crew and cast because they're very precious as they should be about that space. So after a few uh, episodes, they called and told me that they wanted to bring me on full time and I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's a lesson in keeping blind faith when you have no idea what's coming next because I didn't even know to ask the universe for something like this to be on the most successful TV show of all time and to be with icons like Mershka and Ice, that wasn't even on my radar. And to be there now is still something that I have to convince myself is real. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Go ahead, I just wanted to quickly add, first of all, they couldn't have picked anyone better. So let me just say Thank that. Um, and also I feel like, you know, when you were talking about like you were doing something else, I think when we're like detached from something is when we get what we want, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, romantically, that's the old saying too. It's like, you meet someone when you're not looking and it, it and that just happens that way. And it made it even more of a surprise and even more of a, of a gift that I hadn't like had my heart set on it almost, you know, it shocked me back into believing in myself, but it also reminded me of opening up your brain to kind of dreaming bigger to see more possibilities. Ah, absolutely. What's well, such an awesome story. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't sound real, but it's real, you know, and my fiance actually also hadn't worked for 18 months and he booked, his first series regular job within 48 hours of me booking mine, wow. which oh is just crazy. So we'd both been struggling together and somehow fate twisted at the exact same time for both of us, which was a really neat experience. Amazing. That's so awesome. Mm -hmm. Really happy for you, Jamie. And that was beautifully said how, how you put that. Um, Thank who, you. Who was the first person you reached out to to share in your excitement? You know, whoever it was, like, who was that first person? You're like, oh my God, I can't wait to share this with I, I probably called my parents and said, hey, I get to stop borrowing money from you guys again at, at, at 33. <laughs> you know, I, had, I was out of unemployment. I was out of savings. You know, at that point, you're relying on the kindness of others, which I was never comfortable doing. So I learned a lesson in that just alone asking for help is okay and it's available to you. But I, I mean, I told my fiance first and then I called my family and then it sort of spiraled because SVU is one of those shows that's not in mainstream conversation, like a Game of Thrones or like a trendy show like that. But all of a sudden you realize how many people are obsessed with SVU at the, in the comfort of their own homes. Like I have friends who I had no idea have seen like almost every episode. So the second you say SVU, people have an attachment to it. So Definitely. That was really neat to be able to share that with people who had way more of a history with the show than I did. Yeah, that's awesome. 100%. I mean, I've always loved this show. And like, you know, anybody yeah. I know watches SVU, like everybody does. Yeah, It's one of those things you've seen at least a couple episodes of, even if you haven't like followed the show. It's sort of like forensic files, right? Like it's always on when you're in a hotel room or something. And so everyone has like seen, <laughs> it's like a guilty, dark pleasure. And yeah. everyone's seen it at least once. And the joke is that an SVU episode is playing somewhere in the world every second of every day. <laughs> so true. <laughs> so you mentioned the, the preciousness of that space. And again, beautifully said. Um, 
So what is it like with the cast, like offset, you know, when, when things are more just natural? Um, I like to say we put the fun and dysfunctional because we are all so different. We've all come from different walks of life. We check off different boxes as far as the show is concerned. But one thing we all have in common is we're all goofy. So I feel like it's a necessity when dealing with such heavy subject matter all the time that when they say cut, we're goofing around with each other, doing voices, doing shtick, as Mariska likes to call it. You know, we always have something kind of going on. And, and I'm really grateful that they were, despite being such a tight knit group on their own for so long, I think, I think it had been, you know, four or five years, maybe since a new character had been brought on since Peter came. And so I was nervous. I didn't want to muck up the works, you know, and I came on and everybody was so kind. Everyone was welcoming. Everyone made me feel like I had something to offer despite being the new person. And that was a really nice source of validation when you come off of a year and a half of feeling like you don't have anything to offer. Um, so coming in and getting such a warm welcome from the cast, from the crew, from the executives, all of that made it so much easier. Um, I think I put more pressure on myself than anyone else did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. And it's great. It's great. Even to just that you can like learn that again, you know, and, 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 always good to put things into perspective for sure Mm -hmm. Um, is there any one particular thing that you guys like to do or would you say that maybe like the hardest thing that was uh new to kind of like you said maybe uh as a new person is there like a game or is there like just any kind of thing that you guys all do right you do shtick but is there like a specific thing that you guys like to do together um or the first thing that comes to mind I think it's just that we're really good at following one another. So if someone does like a silly voice or something, then we all get in there and start doing the silly boys and we build off each other. Nice. I think as much fun as we have, I think that our directors and our crew on the days when they see that all four or five or six of us are in one room for a scene, everyone's like, oh no, here we go. <laughs> Cause then you get all of our goofy asses in one place. And sometimes it takes a little bit to tamp us down and get refocused so that's the only downside but again that's what makes it doable when you're shooting a show 10 months out of the year Mm. and with a small cast most of us are working five days a week for 10 months straight and while that is a gift and a privilege in our industry to have that type of job security it also is a lot to ask, you know, oftentimes you're doing eight, 10, 12 hour days every day for a week. So if you're pulling 50, 60 hours, you have to be in an environment where you can thrive and survive and be yourself, blow off steam. But one thing I think we do really well that balances all of that is we know when somebody kind of needs their time, or if it's a really heavy scene, everybody takes a sec, composes themselves. You know, there's a lot of mutual respect, regardless of how long you've been on the show you're all treated with that same amount of respect. That sounds, that sounds beautiful. That's awesome. It's just always yeah. nice to hear when, you know, um, cause you never know how things are right on or offset. It's always nice to hear that something, especially something so long running is so awesome and, and just genuine, like on set and off, but not surprising at the same time, cause it's been so long running and so incredibly loved. So really, really. Yeah, I mean, Ice T and Mariska could be monsters. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you've been doing the same show around the same people for that long. Right. That messes with your expectations. That can mess with your sense of self when you're always at this certain level compared to the other people around you. But I've never seen either one of them act like that. You know, it's they're loving and giving and they want to use their experience to help others around them grow because it also makes their life better and makes the show better and it makes working together easier. So getting to witness different leadership styles like that has been also super educational for me. For sure. Yeah. Is there anything else that you're excited about? Anything got in the works? Maybe, maybe well, is that something, something? Well, we all know that we've got the big crossover coming and Stabler yeah. is coming back, which I'm excited about, but I know the fans are freaking because <laughs> it's been a long time. And getting to work with Chris Maloney uh, has sort of checked another box in my SVU experience. And to get to see 
people who have lived in their characters for so long do what they do and do it with ease is also been an amazing learning experience while I'm still developing my character right. and trying to find that level of comfort, trying to understand instincts that I haven't been able to develop for as many years as everyone else has. So the return of Stabler, I know it packs a big punch for all the fans. Super exciting. And I feel like your character, I, like I watch a show and then I look at someone, I'm like, I want to hang out with that person, like your character and just you, like you're someone you want to be like, I want to be that girl's best friend. Like she seems so <laughs> genuine. Like I want to hang out with her. Like she's got my back. That's the vibe that you give off, like as your character and in, in real life too. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, yeah. And just to switch gears a little bit, uh, we're going to go into some girl talk and deeper conversations and this is whatever you feel comfortable talking about um you know everyone's faced challenges in their life and looking back on your own life reflecting on that what was a challenge you had and like what were your learnings about yourself from that experience and like how you evolved and if you have any advice for anybody else I think you know, when I hadn't worked, you know, during that 18 month period, and then again, I started to feel it during quarantine. I realized that oftentimes when I go through challenges, I can be super self-critical. And when you already have all these competing forces, especially in our business, kind of bearing down on you, the last thing you need is for your own voice to be turned against you. And I remember after the first, you know, six months of, of not working and everything, I was just so hard on myself about, you got to get off the couch. You could have been writing. You could be creating your own stuff. Everyone's doing it on YouTube. And you just wasted 18 months that you could have been hiking every day and working on your body or your brain, you know, and you just go through this cycle. But I didn't realize until after the fact that I was actually experiencing a situational depression. Yeah. And that was actually a real thing that was impacting my ability to motivate myself. And in my mind, I was being lazy. I was being unproductive and instead of realizing that there was actually a mental health component there that I was fighting against. And towards the end of that period, when I finally sought some help to try and understand why I was having a hard time with my energy levels, like I went to my doctor and I was like, do I have low vitamin D? You know, I was trying to figure it out. And I started to explain everything to him. And he goes, you know what? I actually think that, that you've been depressed. I think you've been going through a period of depression. And of course I'm like, what? Like, not me. Like I'm not, I've never had depression like that. Well, you don't have to have it your whole life to experience it in a certain period of time. I mean, unfortunately some people have a chemical imbalance that requires medication, but they can get through it if they address it. Right. But for someone who's always been very independent, it was not only hard for me to identify it, but it was hard for me to say okay, maybe you need some help. Maybe you need to not be self-critical. Maybe you need to reach out and let some friends and family know that you're having a hard time because wow. I was always a caretaker. I always wanted to help people with their problems. I've always the person that friends or family come to for advice. So it was really uncomfortable and foreign for me to be on the other side of that coin. And so not only did I learn to ask for help, but I also learned how to be less critical of myself at times when I really needed to show myself some love and that that's also an option for taking care of yourself. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. And we like, we really appreciate that for you being so open. And I really do think that people forget that component of mental health because we go to the gym, we are like focus on our physical health, but then anytime mental health comes up and we're like, Oh, I feel uncomfortable. No, I don't want to talk about this. We try to like turn it away, but like when we're aware of it and how we're feeling, that's how we're going to get through with it. And it's, you know, that just letting yourself feel those things is how you're going to heal in the long run. Healing isn't like bubble baths. I mean, that stuff is nice, <laughs> but the healing process can be ugly, but it takes you to the other side. It's true. And I, we see, well, hopefully we see it less this way, but oftentimes having mental health struggles is seen as a weakness. When in reality, it is a necessary component of the human condition. I don't care who you are. I don't care how rich you are, how you were brought up, how educated you are, how many friends you have. Every one of us has experienced some negative aspect of the human condition. It's just part of it. You know, none of us have done this before. I mean, maybe reincarnation has allowed some insight for some people, but I believe this is it. all of our, <laughs> this is all our, <laughs> our first stabs at it as ourselves right now. 
and no one should have it figured out, nor should anyone expect us to have it figured out. So being vocal, me expressing my struggle, I think is super important because on the outside, Instagram, social media, here's my idealized version of my life. Yeah. No one posts a picture of themselves stuck on the couch watching Real Housewives for the thousandth fucking time. You know what I mean? Well, like I mean, it's... you know, I know yeah. that. I had a mentor. He would always tell us, you know, like anytime you're in a situation, ask yourself like what you're learning about yourself in that situation. He's like, that's how you're going to get to the next level is like a question opens up the mind and a statement closes it. So keep asking yourself, like, what am I learning? Oh, like I'm triggered. Okay. What am I learning about myself? And I realized for myself, I was like, wow, this has actually helped me because I used to be like, Oh, like I feel this way because this is happening. I'm like, Nope, this comes back to me and me learning something about myself. So it yeah, brings the um, control back to you as well to heal and to grow versus it being some external thing that you can't control and you're just subject to, you know, yeah. it makes it so that you can be introspective and be something I've learned is being curious, not judgmental. Mm-hmm. And that small change, that, that change in language has really helped me to say, okay, I'm anxious. What's yeah. going on here? Let me see how I feel instead of here I go. I'm anxious again and yes. being hard on yourself about it. Instead it's, all right, feel a little anxiety. (laughs) And it just makes it so much easier to get through when you're, like you said, you're not coming at it with a statement, you're coming at it with a question. And that allows you to explore it. And like they say, the only way out is through. So let's experience it, experience it, experience it so that we can now get to the peak again faster the next time that we feel that, you know, we can get there sooner the next time. I love that. And just to touch on that a little bit further, what's a mantra that you live by, Jamie? That might be the newest one is just to approach yourself with curiosity. Um, that and one other mantra that I use a lot that I think is super helpful, whether it's a personal issue or professional issue, whatever it is, I try to make decisions that my future self will be grateful for. So even if it's making a hard choice, right? I don't want to have this conversation with this person. But in six months from now, am I going to be glad that I got it out in the air and I dealt with it? Yeah. If you're going through relationship issues and maybe you need to end it with this person, do you want to spend the next six months of your life thinking about it? Or do you want to make a choice now to that your future self will be grateful for and say, thank you, past Jamie, you did that work for me and now it's done. And I think that is something, a way to think about it where you connect yourself to kind of the results of what these... Yeah, the, whatever's difficult right now is going to have a positive result in the future. And it kind of keeps you connected to that. So wise. I love that. <laughs> like a great way to think about it too. Absolutely. I think introspection is arguably the most important thing that we have and that we can do. It's up there for sure. So again, you you put everything so perfectly, Jamie. Um, you also mentioned social media. I think, you know, we all know, right, that it's got its downsides. Um, and it's it's just it's it's too big now it's a permanent part of of the world um and it's never going to go away it's only going to probably continue to evolve um but it's healthy like you said to know when maybe you're spending too much time on there or you know you want to step away whatever it is um and the more you realize your life is really in your control the the better and the more freeing it is um Mm -hmm. mentioning instagram and social media in general is there any particular like random comment or dm that you got at some point that just like sticks out it's just like what the hell is this or just something really funny or awesome um i (laughs) remember it's kind of funny because again i don't necessarily see myself in the place of progress that maybe i am to other people you know i I still see myself as my goofy awkward drama kid self (laughs) so i remember like you know i don't know i i wrote I think it was, um, I've, I'm a lifelong Washington football team fan. Okay. And when our third string quarterback Heineke came into a game and had a really good game, I posted, you know, and I said, this dude came in and under the most pressure ever performed. And I like wrote some compliment, you know, posted a picture of him. And like a week later, he wrote back to me and I was like, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you know that blue check like makes you a little yeah, more noticeable yeah. to people but I don't <laughs> see myself like that I don't have that blue check in my everyday life you know hanging above my head and so when he wrote hey thanks I was like <gasps> you know I, turned, I was like Michael my fiance I was like Michael 
Michael, he wrote me back. He wrote me back. <laughs> <laughs> like, so excited. That's it's probably awesome. that is up there. And then also this young woman, Laurel Bristow, who um, her Instagram is King Gutter Baby. And she has become a huge account during the pandemic because she's a young epidemiologist who I think she said previously she had like 500 followers and within a month of the pandemic, she went up to like 250,000. And she does these very like pedestrian versions of explaining to you everything that's happening. And it's in a a way that anyone can understand. It it takes all these like fallacies and debunks some. And she's just got a way of speaking that helps you understand what's happening. And I like wrote her a note just to say like, thank you for helping to make some sense of all of the chaos of information that exists right now. And she wrote back, oh my God, thank you so much. I love SVU. And I was like, what? She watches SVU? And then, <laughs> again, just like freaked out. And like, my fiance is not as much involved in social media. So he laughs at me first because like it holds value to me. But those things are the ones that, that still get me and catch me off guard that like some random stranger who I admire for whatever reason is conversing with me. And <laughs> Social media, as far as good things that it's done has, you know, it closes that distance in in certain cases. And I I still remember just being like, ah, (laughs) such a dork about it. Um, And in reckoning with the fact that you hold value to strangers is, is a very weird thing to have to sort of wrap your brain around. And those are examples of when that kind of just shakes me. Well, first of all, I remember that game. I'm a natural rival to you as a Cowboys fan, but um, <laughs> at least you're not an Eagles fan. It could be worse. Yeah, that's it, that would definitely be worse. Uh, but I remember that game, and he was incredible. Uh, I don't remember who who they were playing, but he he had an absolutely unbelievable game, and I was just like, good for him, because I, I didn't even know like the guy's name, and I think everyone expected when he came in that it was like, okay, this is going to be bad, you know. But he he tore it up, um, and I loved what you yeah. said. The uh, that you don't always feel you have the blue check like hovering around you in your everyday life you know that's beautiful and I think some people walk around well aware that they do um but you know you definitely are you know definitely seem very down to earth chill humble um which is awesome and great to see yeah and you just put it so you put it so well so it's more sustainable to be down to earth I think absolutely it's gotta be oh yeah yeah for sure you want to be around you more like you know it's like the energy thing it's like when you have that energy where you're open and welcoming people embrace that they want to be around it more when it's you know like the egotisticalness people just don't want to be around you then you know like it's think about it yeah well it's like i think some people create that distance in order to increase their own self-worth and it's sad that that's the only way they can go about it right to create that distance between them and everyone else is what makes them valuable Yep. When I think it's way more valuable to be able to relate to people and to make them see their success as possible because you're not, I don't come from money. I don't come from a family in, in the arts. You know, I, I come from a regular neighborhood. I went to college and studied and, you know, I get parking tickets. and got my car towed a hundred freaking times when I first moved to LA, you know, I did the whole thing. So I think it just makes those types of things more accessible to people. Well, yeah. I think anyone can rise or fall, right? So I think always keeping that perspective of just like, you're just another person and treating other people with the same respect, which clearly you do, is great. And that's how all people should strive to be. But we're one of the reasons we're happy to have you on here because you clearly are that way, so. Yeah, you are. Like, we could hang out with you forever. You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so what, I, how, how long is this going until? Because uh, we, we, we should be wrapping up. So <laughs> I'm going to... Ask one more question from the list and then Ryan's going to wrap it up with the last question. So this is just our like fun and light questions like Ryan asked. So, and this is whatever you feel comfortable talking about, but do you have any funny like date stories or pickup lines that someone has used on you? Maybe your fiance, like how you win you over, you know, tell us a fun story. <laughs> Actually, I have a great story about my fiance and I, because the first thing that we ever bonded of, we met on a job and we got put in the same car service to go for our fittings. And the first conversation that we had was our mutual mutual hatred of Dan Snyder because he's from Virginia as well. And it just so happened that we get put in the same car and started to have a conversation. And our entire first conversation was about how we wanted somehow to assassinate Dan Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I have never tried so little to impress someone like I, I didn't get girly or anything it was like the easiest 
conversation ever. And that was the first day that we met. That was our first sort of mutual conversation that we had, which oh, that's so like, it's, so, it's so funny because I wasn't like trying to impress him or anything at the time. We just had a natural conversation and that's where it went. And then he asked you out on like a real day. He's like, Jamie, like, I want to take you out for dinner. Or did he like make that, you know, gentleman move? It, it kind of happened naturally because we were on a job in Hawaii, sort of sequestered on our own. And I had some friends who lived there who I knew my whole life who were picking me up to hang. And I kind of said, dude, do you want to come with and chill with us and have some fun? And he came and we just hit it off. I mean, it was pretty fast. <laughs> That's awesome. Like very organic though. It sounds like very, very organic. Yes. It's awesome. Well, it's like you said, you know, what, what we've talked about with uh, when you're not trying, but sustainable too, right? So when you're being yourself in every way, those are the best relationships, uh, starters and dates because it's sustainable. You're being you. There's, you're not absolutely anything. So when that works, like you're in good shape, you know? Yeah. I've been stuck in places where I've presented myself to be something that I'm not necessarily every day. And if that's the part of me that person likes, then we're screwed. <laughs> yep. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so you know the last question, Ryan. You know what it is. <laughs> There's so many other things I want to talk about. Okay, I know. Uh, Jamie, finish this statement for me. Okay. Never have I ever gone skydiving. Me neither, actually. Me either. <laughs> I think a lot of people are like terrified of going skydiving. You're like jumping out of like this plane, and you know, yeah. Over to land. <laughs> yep. So that actually brings up an interesting because I've had this discussion. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Skydiving or bungee jumping? What scares you more? I've done sort of a bungee jumping type thing before. Although now when I think about it, I'm like, how do people not snap their necks bungee <laughs> jumping? Um, I, and what's funny is my fear is not hitting the ground. My fear is that I'm going to be so scared while I'm skydiving that I'm going to throw up and choke in the middle of the air. That is <laughs> valid. That's valid. <laughs> you want to get specific? That's the fear that I'm worried about jumping out of a plane that I'm going to be scared. I'm going to throw up and I'm going to choke on. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, Jamie, thank you so much. This was so fun. It was so great to have you on. Thank yes, you. Yes, thank you guys so much. And we'll be we'll be watching. And you know, Kelly was our cover girl um a few months ago. Tell her tell her I say hi. I will. I told her I was gonna speak with you guys and she said that you were so lovely. So I felt good about that. Aww, so nice. mm -hmm. Awesome. Jamie, thank, thank you so much. much. Awesome to talk to you. You good too. luck on, hey. uh, on your on your success and on your life. And hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds good. I'd love it. Bye. Bye. Bye.